Americanized Chinese dishes like orange chicken, mm-hmm. General Tso's, right? Those were those aren't like real Chinese dishes. Those are just those were created in America for the white man, mm. right? And but the reason why they did that is because it comes from a business standpoint, mm. right? Like I got to stay in business, so I got to feed the, these. <laughs> these I, I got to be able to sell this food, and the only people around me are all white, so they're. I got to make sure it fits their palate, yeah, right. Nothing wrong with like fried chicken, like dunked in orange sauce, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's how those dishes came about. Huh. But then you look at all these, but like Chinese food is the only one that has that. But you look at other cuisines like Vietnamese, Korean. Japanese. In five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Late Night Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your host, Big Bubbaloo Titty Boo. <laughs> Today we have the the lately stylings of Jazzy McGap Tooth. Uh, Hey, yo, it's me, Jazzy McGap Tooth. <laughs> how y'all fine ladies doing tonight? So, Jazzy, how'd you end up having that gap tooth your whole life? I don't know. <laughs> I was born with this shit, I was bitch. born with it. <laughs> As a sensitive subject, don't ever talk about it That's again. That's why I whistle every time I talk. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you do that shit when you talk I and whistle? I can't. Like like a fucking herb from a herb or, or what was it? Was Herbert the, grab- the pervert? Yeah, Herbert the Herbert the pervert from a Family Guy. I tried. Hey, Chris. I can't, I can't do it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Come back here with your fat ass. You know what I've been doing a lot during the quarantine? I've been watching a lot of uh, documentaries. Mm. Have you seen this doc? Mm-hmm. Nuts. It's I. I don't want to fuck up the name, but mm-hmm. it's about it's about triplets that they okay. that found uh, each other later on in life. Have oh, you sure. heard about this? Mm-mm. So this documentary, I'm going to just spoil it for people who haven't seen it. I don't know the name of it, but just watch it in general because there's a lot of specificities that I'm forgetting about it. Mm -hmm. But essentially this documentary is about um, three triplets that were uh, separated at birth that went to three different families. They had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so how the doc starts off, it's one of the triplets talking about how he went to college. And when he went to college or or high school, I forgot what it was, but either way, when he was there, uh, people were coming up to him shaking his, yo, what's up, man? How you been? He goes, what the fuck? I've never been here before. <laughs> shaking his hand, giving yeah. him props and dabs. Yo, yeah. it's good to see you. I thought you weren't going to be here this year. Yeah. Random girl comes up to him, kisses him straight on the mouth. She goes, I miss you. I'm glad you're here. He's like, yo, this is the best fucking school ever. You know, he, he's, he has to do nothing. And he's like the yeah. most popular dude in school. Yeah. So he gets into his room or his, his dorm room or whatever. And um, a, a guy comes in looks at him, drops his shit, just shocked. Like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. And he just, he imme- immediately knows that that's not his friend mm-hmm. because he knows he's not supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. But he goes, you know, he just starts asking him these very specific questions. I'm kind of slaughtering this right now. I'm not sure if this is exactly how it was, but <laughs> yeah. he was like, you know, what's like, what's your name? He goes, wait, when were you born? And let's say the birthday is July 15th. He goes, okay, July 15th. He goes, were you adopted? He goes, you were adopted. He goes, I know your brother. Mm-hmm. You, have a tw- you have an identical twin brother. Mm-hmm. Yo, what's up? Starts freaking the fuck out. Uh, they eventually go to meet this other guy who is his identical twin brother, and mm-hmm. he finds out that he has a fucking twin. They didn't know his whole life. Yeah, and so this starts. He starts freaking out or whatever. Um, I, I guess a few uh, news publications got wind of this that two twins, two adopted twins, were separated at birth, and they had no idea. Mm-hmm. The uh, adoption agency didn't, quote unquote, didn't have any idea either. Mm-hmm. They find out later on after this story starts to blow up. Somebody else goes, yo, hold on a second. I look like them too. There's a (laughs) fucking triplet. That's crazy. There's a triplet and they find each other and they start to become this huge, like at the time media sensation. Mm -hmm. They're blowing up. And so what you find out later on this documentary is that they weren't just split up at birth. It was done on purpose as a psychological, as a psych study. Oh, wow. As a fucking study. What year did this take place? This was, I would have to say, let me look that shit up. But it was done as a psych study. Uh And the reason why they did it was to see, uh, it's basically the argument versus nature versus nurture. Right. And so this specific adoption agency in New York Mm -hmm. didn't just split them up, multiple twins and triplets to see if the nature versus nurture argument is real. Mm. Well, well, this psychologist, he actually has all those, he passed away, Mm -hmm. but before he died, is actually, he had all these studies locked up at Yale University Mm -hmm. and it's not supposed to be released until like 2068. (laughs) What the fuck? Why? why? So these twins can't, they found out after uh-huh. he passed away and yeah. all this all these other twins started to pop up saying yeah. like yo uh, i didn't know i had a twin either yeah 
Um, and they were finding out that they all came from that same adoption agency. So uh -huh. this psychologist was running these human experiments yeah. to see if it's nature versus nurture uh -huh. on a bunch of these kids and none of them had any fucking idea. Oh, that's fucking unethical. <laughs> it's unethical <laughs> as fuck, dude. Yeah, and so when you go to the doc, mm -hmm. you start finding out um, the weird part is, is that these kids who never met each other, mm -hmm. like these triplets, had the same mannerisms, right? Same sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, they dated, like, I'm not sure if they dated, but they had the same taste in women, mm -hmm. a same taste in food, mm -hmm. and they've never met each other once. Didn't know who the fuck they were. Didn't mm -hmm. know that the other person existed, but they had identical um, similarities in terms of what they liked and disliked. Mm. Fucking nuts. Yeah, insane. Yeah, no, I mean, I've definitely heard about documentaries like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think there's, uh, you know. Uh, good amount of those type of documentaries out there like separated twins uh, yeah. at birth and they rediscover each other at some point in their life and the documentary is documenting you know the reuniting of them um but what's this one called this one is called uh the incredible story of the triplets it was a documentary called son of a bitch I know it. I will put it in. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you see it? On Netflix? On Hulu. Oh, Hulu. Okay. I saw it on Hulu. Uh -huh. And so while they were doing these experiments um, and they kind of find out, they, they found out how they started piecing things together in terms of when they were uh, adopted, these people would come over and mm -hmm. they would start doing like block studies and all this like weird ink blot shit with these kids. Mm -hmm. And what they told their parents at the time was that, oh, this is what we need to do when you guys adopt these kids. We have to make sure that they're mentally stable or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they were just basically feeding them bullshit because yeah. they were falling up on their test subjects. That's fucking terrible, man. And so one of the biggest <laughs> tells was that one of the fathers, uh, when they found out that they, they were all separated at birth, these parents were pissed. Mm. So one of the twins, one of the triplets, they he had a father that was known to be a super loving guy. Everybody loved him. And even when they all the twins came, all the, the triplets came together to meet this man, they always talked uh, great things about him mm -hmm. or said great things about him anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so after they went to this agency and they told him that it was an accidental mix up, which it wasn't because they did it on purpose. Yeah. Uh, they were just pissed and they left. Mm -hmm. Well, he forgot either his coat or something along the lines of that or, or, his, or his umbrella goes back. And when he goes back to go uh, get his stuff, he overlooks and, and sees the people that just gave them the explanation, like the psych the psychiatrist that uh -huh. were running this experiment uh -huh. um, after they told him this bullshit lie. He said, it was odd because when I went back, I, they were popping champagne as if they just dodged a huge bullet. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was like the onset of something's really up here. Yeah. Um, when you watch the documentary, the documentary, you start to, uh, one of the things that became very true and apparent was mm -hmm. that these these triplets and twins that were all separated at birth. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, they kind of alluded to the fact that they all had some type, they definitely dealt with a lot of like mental issues and stress. Mm. And they think that it's led be, um, from what they're saying on the documentary, it was that um, there were certain behaviors that they had uh, that was very, eminent that they had uh, separation anxiety mm. because they were separated from their triplets or mm -hmm. twins. Mm -hmm. So for example, some of the kids would, um, one of the kids would cry so much that they would just start banging their head on their crib because they either had like anxiety issues, but yeah. they would just start hurting themselves. Yeah, and They didn't know why. They uh -huh. didn't know what was going on. Uh -huh. um, but then now they're kind of assuming as parents, like it had to be because they were separated from their, crazy. From their brothers. Yeah. That's crazy that there's, you know, that deep of a connection on like a biological level yeah you know, on dna level where it's like even if you're not cognizant of the fact that you are part of a this bigger whole you f you feel that in some sense even when you're an infant or a toddler uh that that's crazy man they also oh i forgot to add this too they also separated those kids uh purposefully mm -hmm. into different class systems. One was wow. really poor, one was middle class, and one <laughs> was upper middle class. That's some fucked up shit, man. I mean, it's interesting. It makes for an interesting documentary, obviously. And check this out. Yeah. It, it even runs deeper than that. Yeah. So obviously with this case too, with the case study and any type of psychological or scientific experiment, you need to control, mm -hmm. right? So the control experiment was that every, every one of those parents actually adopted a previous child before them that mm -hmm. was a girl. So they had a, an adopted daughter all the same age wow. as a control. Wow. 
I mean, so the people, those parents who adopted them, did they know this experiment was no, going on? They had no fucking oh, idea. Okay. None of them knew. Okay. So they didn't under they didn't question why uh, people would come over and show these kids these uh, ink blot tests and and do these like mental studies on them. They yeah. just assumed, well, not assumed, but they told them was that this was something that you signed up for that it was necessary for mm, the kid uh, because just to make adopted. sure that their health and all that is exactly. Good. Yeah. So they knew about whatever some destructive behaviors that some of these kids had mm-hmm. at, at, at a young age, but the parents had no fucking idea. They didn't even know that they were triplets or twins. That's crazy, man. And so it, it came out of that very specific adoption agency. Yeah. And nobody can see those files to like 2050 something or 2060 something. Yeah. That's that's wild, man. Insane. Yeah. Blew my fucking mind. Yeah. The how unethical like psychological studies were done back in the day mm-hmm. is fucking unreal. Yeah, I mean because for those people, for those uh doctors, right? Uh all they wanted to do was just scratch the itch for their curiosity. Yeah, just to see what I happened. wonder. You, you have all these crazy fucking thoughts and ideas and there's nothing really in place to stop you from doing it, right? Nature what? versus nurture, man. They were, no. They're really trying to figure it out. And this study right now is inconclusive because the study hasn't been released. All the data that has been found. Mm-hmm. And some of these psychiatrists uh, are, are still alive till this day. Mm-hmm. And they're not saying shit. Mm-hmm. And all those files are locked up at Yale University right now. Wow. So they don't, these kids who who know about this experiment, yeah. they will not hear about any of this shit well, why even before they die. Why was why isn't Yale releasing them? They can't. Know. They can't? Yeah, I think they legally they can't do it. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that fucking nuts? Yeah. I'd imagine there's some sort of legal loophole to, to get access to that. I, w- but, I would hope so. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not sure, but it could be because they're trying to, I don't know what those case studies or findings are, but what mm-hmm. if those people who were a part of the experiment finds out, you know, whatever the findings are and it fucks them up in the head. So maybe they're waiting. Well, until- shit, man. I don't see how it wouldn't already fuck them up in the head yeah. knowing that your whole life was a science experiment, you know, to see. One of the triplets uh, actually committed suicide. Oh, shit. Yeah. It gets very fucking dark. <laughs> yeah, it gets really fucking dark, man. Oh, man. This whole thing was it, like listening to it. And it reminded me because when I was in college, I was I had a psych minor. Um, and I'm pretty sure everybody who took psych remembers this case study. I'm not sure if it was – it's not a nature versus nurture study. It was based on seeing if – if a child's physiological needs are met, does it need a, uh, does it have an emotional need that needs to be met in order for uh, humans to survive? Mm-hmm. So um, during this time, I'm not sure if, if these kids were orphan children or not, mm-hmm. but there was a bunch of children mm-hmm. that were used in this study. And I could be slaughtering this once again. This was this was literally 10 years ago, <laughs> 10, 12, 14 years ago. Yeah. So um, these kids were used as a case study to see if uh, physiological needs uh, are well, they are important, like in terms of what they need for food and water and light or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And so they had people who were caregivers that would take care of them. They mm-hmm. would feed them, give everything that they need to phys- physically survive. Yeah. But no human contact. Right. Right. And we all know that when kids are born, they always suggest that a mother um, holds their child so they have skin to skin contact mm-hmm. so they create a connection with their child. Mm-hmm. And that's the loving part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Well, these kids who didn't have. Um, that obviously weren't a part of the control part of the study mm-hmm. that didn't have physiological, like physical contact. So their physiological needs weren't met. They all died. Yeah, of course. I yeah. mean, cause, cause the thing is the, the basic, uh, I guess, building block for becoming a human being is socialization. You need agents of socialization. But it's so odd that they yeah. die though. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I was kind of shocked. Uh-huh. I was kind of, not a single kid survived. Yeah. And here's the fucked up shit. Once once a majority of these kids that were dying, mm-hmm. they, they started dying off and you know the experiment was getting a little wonky. They they took a, a chunk of those kids out. Well, they were exib- exhibiting some very weird behaviors. Mm-hmm. And even when they removed them from that situation and they gave them human contact and yeah. all that other stuff, yeah. they still ended up dying. Yeah, it's too late at that point because yeah. um, a child's ability to uh, learn language, I think it's capped out by the time you're what like six or seven i mean i i don't know oh, the these exact kids were age. like months old oh they're months old they, they didn't okay. live that long okay they they, they died they okay. were within within like a span of a few months I believe. yeah because there i think there's that one uh story about that kid who was basically abandoned right and he was getting raised by a pack of wolves oh yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah the wolf boy yeah the wolf boy and they, they couldn't bring him back no they couldn't yeah he still had those tendencies and you know they tried to feed him regular human food but at that point it was already too late and he ended up dying too i think 
Oh, really? Yeah, because because they couldn't they couldn't get him to become a. It was already too late at that point. It was beyond the point where they can socialize him into becoming a human being. He already is like a rabid dog, you know. <laughs> Dude, it's 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 weird because even even till this day, I can't understand. It, it kind of makes me think about kind of like the human spirit and soul, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at it from a logical standpoint, right? If we're saying that all we need is sustenance to survive, yeah. Um, why didn't any of these kids survive? Mm -hmm. Because they had what they needed mm -hmm. in terms of what a human being needs to live or a mammal or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. But just simply not being touched, not feeling love, not mm -hmm. feeling affection or having mm -hmm. a skin-to-skin -skin contact mm -hmm. is the reason why they they died. Mm -hmm. It's It blows my fucking mind. Mm. Um, Actually, I found it here. So in the United States in 1944, an mm -hmm. experiment was conducted on 40 newborn infants to determine whether individuals could thrive alone on basic physiological needs without affection. 20 newborn infants were housed in a special facility where they had caregivers who would go in to feed them, bathe them, and change their diapers, but they would do nothing else. Mm. That's fucking nuts. Yeah. The caregivers had been instructed to not look at or touch the babies more than what was necessary, never communicating with them. All their physical needs were attended to scrupulously and the environment was kept sterile. None of the babies became ill. The spirit was halted after four months, mm -hmm. by which time at least half of the babies died mm -hmm. at that point. At least two more died even after being rescued and brought into a more natural familial environment. Mm -hmm. There was no physiological cause for the baby's deaths. They were all physically very healthy. Mm -hmm. Before each baby died, there was a period where they would stop verbalizing and trying to engage with their caregivers, generally stop moving, nor cry or even change expression. Death would follow shortly. The babies who had given up before being rescued died in the same manner, even though they had been removed from the experimental conditions. Mm. That's fucking crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, but you think about it like... We're talking about what millions of years of like evolution and things that are built into our DNA of like our needs, you mm -hmm. know, and the fact that you're taking an approach, a drastically different approach to how a normal child is usually raised. Um, it, in that sense, it's not that surprising. It's like, yes, you're talking about certain basic needs needs being met but there's a whole other set of basic needs that aren't being met and when that happens it's more like how bad is the damage that that should that should be the, I think question. the shocking thing is most people can't even understand or even for me it's mm -hmm. like why would that cause death though yeah that's well, the hard what, part. what's surprising for me is that they died that early on yeah four months and yeah. they died it's yeah. almost like the spirit wasn't tended to mm -hmm. so it's it, they just chose to leave the body that's what it sounds like it's like yo my I'm needs done. aren't being that i'm done i'm leaving this fucking baby body and yeah. i'm gonna go into something else yeah. it creeps me out a bit yeah yeah uh that yeah that, it is it is a trip to think about you know and it makes me think too where you know we were talking about it earlier on the podcast where some of these people who don't have friends and i know that you know, a lot of people say that they're introverts and they don't need a lot of human contact. Mm -hmm. But I genuinely believe people do need human contact and that oh, we are absolutely. social human beings to absolutely. a certain extent. Yeah. And they're probably getting it when they're online or they're, you know, doing whatever, you know, they're doing that part of, of socializing. So mm -hmm. maybe it, it kind of meets their needs on some low level. Mm -hmm. But during this quarantine too, I don't think a lot of people realize how much they missed having people around. Or how important it is yeah. for their psyche. Mm -hmm. They're just their mental health. I mean, uh, you know, you're seeing uh, numbers of divorces rising, yeah. right? People uh, seeking therapy rising. I mean, it's- Just to have somebody to fucking talk to. Yeah, it's no mystery, man. Like that interaction gets removed and things that you take for granted on a daily basis, once that's not there anymore, maybe you don't realize how important that was to you, um, not just from like, entertainment level but but like i said a mental health level yeah and it it, it wrecks people you know because man look time having too much time and thoughts is always a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. you know what i yeah. mean <laughs> man we i just had a conversation with um with uh with joe mm -hmm. and he was talking about how he knows somebody who you know i think has for, on, on a paper basis, right? So when you look at him uh, on, like stats, mm -hmm. he has everything that he needs. Mm -hmm. Very wealthy, very well put together, a hyper logical guy, right? But there's something in his life that he feels is kind of missing mm -hmm. and he's looking for he's looking for that. And he's looking for that in companionship and in other, other people. Mm -hmm. And I think 
uh, we always, I think maybe it's because we're Asian American too, that we think that our career and money is always going to make us happy. Mm. And um, I found out only like maybe a few years ago that that stuff is really on the lowest part of my totem pole. Yeah. And I think for me, when I started to kind of piece that thought together was when uh, people around me, they were equating their happiness and their success to the m amount of money that they had, mm -hmm. right? And so when I started getting a lot of money, it didn't feel the same. Yeah. And then I started thinking about my parents, right? So uh, my mom always, my mom told me, and we had this conversation that, where she was saying that she, um, saving money doesn't really do much for you. And what she meant by that is like, you should save money. So you're safe and you're comfortable and you should always work hard and, and make money. That's okay. She goes, but if you're having, if you're working hard, you're not sleeping, you're not getting to do the things you want in life. Yeah. She goes, life is finite. What's, what's the point? What's the whole point of you hoarding this money? Where is it going? Yeah. She goes, I raised you and your brother in our house, in our house that we've had for X amount of years, right? Do you need a gigantic house? Mm -hmm. You know, she mm -hmm. goes, what are you saving up for? Are you saving up this huge home for what? She goes, I raised you, your brother, and your grandparents live with us too in this house. And she goes, did you ever think for once that it felt crap? Or did you start feeling that it, it was small because you looked at our house and you started comparing it to other people's? So it's weird how sometimes too, like we don't, I, I started thinking too, like I don't, oh, these these things aren't the stuff that makes me happy. I like socializing, right? Because mm -hmm. we obviously we can move somewhere else, save a lot more money, Yeah. right? And I have a friend right now who's planning to move out and I think I think the move that he's making financially makes a lot of sense. And for for what he's doing, it's dope, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But but for me, it doesn't make any sense because yeah. I'm a social human being, and mm -hmm. I need to be around people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it just kind of begs the age old question, right? What is the meaning of life? It's a philosophical question. It's an existential question. Um, and look, you're not ever gonna have like a definitive answer to that. Yeah, no, one's, no, one, no one's gonna be able to tell you this is the meaning of life. I, I mean, for me, I feel like it's a very open-ended question. You define that meaning yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look for what fulfills you, what brings you happiness in life, and it's a learning process. You're not gonna know that right out the gate. You're gonna have to go through certain experiences and certain things to understand what it is that you find value in. And Look, I'm sure there are plenty of people who find value in money and materialistic things that it does make them happy on a certain level where it's enough for them. And then there are others who look at that and it's like, I mean, yeah, shit, having more money is always nice, but yeah. it doesn't make, it doesn't fulfill me in the way that I need, that yeah. I seek. Um, and so I'm in the same boat with you. Like having money is nice for sure in terms of maintaining a certain quality of life not having the certain stresses and struggles that come with not having money but at the end of the day it's like it doesn't bring me fulfillment in in, in the way that i would like to have you know yeah it's it's weird like i've got i've gotten to this point in my life now where i think because mortality is as you get older, it starts to become more and more apparent. Mm -hmm. Like dying is something that's very, very real. Oh, shit, especially these days, right? I know, right? <laughs> You'd be croaking left and right, yeah. man. And I, I think because of that, I'm always thinking about now, like if I pass away today or if I pass away tomorrow, or maybe even like five or six years from now, you know, what are the what are the memories that I would keep and what, what are the memories that make me happy the most? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to think about, right? Mm -hmm. And I found out that traveling was one of the biggest things that made me happy. Absolutely. Being able to experience other cultures, being able to be a little uncomfortable, um, get out of your skin a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I I truly believe this too now because I, I stopped buying like, look at look at me right now. I look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> with, with this dope with purple this donut. donut PJ pants. You know, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely, I, I'm like, I have clothes, you know, but <laughs> I'm in a podcast. I'm trying to be comfortable, yeah. but it's not something that's in the forefront of my mind, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to impress people by the, by the way I look with the things that I have. What I'm trying to think about now is what I'm walking away. If I had, if I lived, if I only had like a day to live every day, mm -hmm. right? What is the stuff that I'm going to take away from this? Yeah. When I travel, the cool thing is, is that's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Like even the other day, I I rem I forgot that I did a whole Taiwan series where I was in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I when I look back and I watch those videos that I made, and I only did three or four days of shooting out of the eight days that I was there. Yeah. I can look at that look at that and feel super happy for again. sure. Every physical material possession that I've bought, mm -hmm. when I look back at it, it means shit to me. Yeah, absolutely. It only matters for that moment. It's yeah. such a momentary thing. Whereas, like you said, I mean, 
I can relate because like I said, I'm in the same boat. I mean, yeah. there are others who won't agree with, with that sentiment, but yeah. yeah, same thing for me is that when I'm traveling, it's such a such a magical process, man. I mean, like even I like I like to get on airplanes too. I and I love being at the airport. I I know a lot of people hate that whole process of going through security. I fucking hate it. Yeah, I know. But for me, I enjoy people watching. And what better place is there to people watching that at airport? You got people from all different walks of life, and it's so interesting to see how they interact or how they react in a situation. And then getting to the destination that you're going to. Once you get there, it's like this this feeling of rush, man. Like, dude, everything I'm going to see, everything I'm going to smell, everything I'm going to experience is going to be new for the first time. Like, how many of those do you get as you get older? Yeah. That this is the first time I've ever seen that. This is the first time I've ever stepped foot on, in this place. So to be able to get that to at each new place, each new country, each new city, whatever you go to, it, it's an incredible feeling, man. And then to, to kind of, learn in the limited amount of time that you have about the culture, about the food, about just the way of life there. I mean, it's such a, it, that's the type of fulfillment that I'm looking for when yeah. I seek fulfillment. And when I, when I tell people this and you know, they, I think sometimes when people go, well, you, that's cause you have money to travel. Mm -hmm. True. That is true. Mm -hmm. But it's also based on the amount of importance that I, and by the way, I'm speaking to a very specific, uh, when we say these things too, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about somebody who has like three kids, you know, they're, they're, right, they're right, locked down. I'm right. talking about if you're single, right. you know, you have a job, right? And you feel like you can't afford it because there's other things that you want. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that you could always navigate those finances if you aren't locked down by very specific things mm -hmm. to make travel a priority. Right. It gives you a lot of perspective. Absolutely. And when I when I talk about physical, I'm not talking about the guy who was a musician and then he has his first guitar that he ever bought, mm -hmm. you know, with the money that he paid for this gig. Yeah. I'm not talking about that story. That physical possession is going to mean a lot to him, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about buying the newest, dopest shit. Yeah, man. I've never bought a pair of shoe mm -hmm. unless it was like some something that somebody gave me yeah. or it was a symbol of me making money. Like those are the shoes that I kept. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this means something to mm -hmm. me. But let's say tomorrow, I don't know, fucking Kanye drops this dope shoe, right? I buy it. It feels dope that I have it. I put it on my feet. 10 years from now, I'm not going to look at that shoe. Not even like, 10 years from now, bro. A, a week from now, yeah. I'm not going to be like, yo, I remember that time when I bought yeah, that exactly. Yeezy and I put that exactly. shit on my feet. It was dope. That's the thing. You have to reflect on what are the happiest moments in your life. And I don't think I have a single happy memory that has to do with like a purchase or like money. You know, I mean, look, man, I had moments in my life where I did make a lot of money, yeah. you know, and, and look for that time. It was good, right? You're young. You want to spend, you want to get shit, especially when you've grown up, you know, not exactly in the best financial situation. There were a lot of things you couldn't get. Yeah, and so, when you buy it, it's like, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have that freedom. I have uh -huh. that luxury and to experience that. From for somebody who comes from my background was was great, but it wasn't like life changing, and it it didn't shape me into like the person that I am today. It was so momentary, you yeah. know. And I think when people say money doesn't buy happiness, I'm not saying money doesn't make shit easier. Money makes shit fucking oh, for easier sure, for sure. You know, it allows you to travel, allows yeah. you to eat the shit that you want. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that shit at all. I'm saying that from my experience and from what I've seen, you could do without that and still live a very fulfilling life. Yeah. But I don't think it's the other way around. Yeah. You know, unless yeah. you're somebody just, your happiness is buying dope shit all the time, then you are in the right lane. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're in the fucking right lane. That's your shit. I think, I think there's a lot of uh, factors and variables that play into kind of your stance on that and your perspective on that, like education, culture, you know, the people that you're around, it, it all shapes those values, you know, and what you value in life. And um, I think that there's no right or wrong way to define those values. It's it's whatever is right or wrong for you. Um, but I feel like there is, if you talk to people who are a little bit older and a little bit more experienced. So I'm saying like, if you're, sub 21 then you still got a lot of life to live you still yeah. got you still got a lot of uh growing and finding to do in terms of who you are as a person and really defining your identity and your worldview. but then you talk to people who are like 30 and over i think they start to have a little bit more experience under their belt where they feel a certain way about things yeah. you know um and for me i think i've always wanted to travel 
but just the financial situation mm -hmm. didn't allow it or one of the major factors that didn't allow it amongst yeah. other reasons and then once i had the ability to do that and and what you just alluded to is that it traveling can be expensive but it doesn't have to be yeah. you know like for example like tokyo is is my favorite city in the world that i visited thus far right yeah. People always think, oh, Tokyo is one of the most expensive cities in the world. It can be. Yeah, depending on how you do it. Yeah, LA can also be one of the most expensive cities in the world, yeah. right? New York can be one of the most expensive cities in the world. But there's ways you can navigate around that. And like you said, it's about priorities, right? What is your priority when you travel then? Is it to stay at luxury hotels and resorts? Or is it to really be there and to explore? Because you can routinely find tickets, round trip tickets, like in, in economy to Tokyo for like, 400 bucks yeah right through deals it might be in in, in like off peak uh, season but you can still get there and two you could stay at capsule hotels mm -hmm. airbnbs to make it affordable you don't have to eat at the nicest restaurant you can easily get by spending 10 bucks a day on food every yeah. day you know yeah eating at convenience stores because their convenience store food is bomb as fuck it's so good <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's because when people travel to that i think not everybody's having the right perspective. I don't want to say right. Everybody's perspective is different, different yeah. right? So if you're going there to, to stunt for the gram mm -hmm. and you want to show people that you're this worldly human being mm -hmm. by staying at the coolest places on earth, right. bitch, you could do that shit anywhere. Yeah. Honestly, you really could. You yeah. could do that shit at the Ritz Carlton in LA. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to travel because you like experiencing cultures and you just, you just want to have a fresh take on something that you haven't seen before, mm -hmm. it's very plausible. Mm -hmm. And how I put it like this is like, yo, how many times do you go out to get a, a Starbucks coffee and a Coke or whatever, right? You could save about 400 bucks to travel within a year. For sure. Easy. For sure. For sure. Straight up easy. Yeah. If there's, if there's a will, there's a fucking way. When yeah. it comes to saving money, yeah. if there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Especially if you're single, you don't have kids. Yeah. And all you have to do is fend for yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse for why you can't have those things if you don't have any of those things weighing you down. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because you're not prioritizing your money the way that the way that it should be used or the way that you say that you want it to be used. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's it's very possible. When I first went to Hawaii, I was fucking broke. Mm -hmm. I just saved money to go. Yeah. And I didn't eat crazy expensive stuff. I stayed at the cheapest hotels and I we split an Airbnb. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. But I had one of the best experiences that I've ever had was when I went with those specific people. Mm -hmm. We split an Airbnb and we did bullshit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I didn't go. I wasn't in Waikiki. Yeah. I wasn't at the most fanciest restaurants. I wasn't eating any of that shit. I was yeah. eating at Zippy's, which is their fucking Denny's basically. <laughs> right? <laughs> going to 7-Eleven, getting Musubis, yeah. going to the beach. This podcast is brought to you by Raycon. Do not pay for overpriced wireless earbuds when you can get them at less than half the price of other guys. That's where Raycon comes in. I've had my E25 earbuds for a hot minute and I love them. Working out or just walking around listening to a podcast. They're super lightweight and super compact. I do not like bulk, son. If you're listening to wired earbuds, do you also drive a Flintstone car, you caveman? You are better than this. You deserve better. For a limited time, get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com brain. That's buyraycon.com brain. For a 15% discount on Raycon wireless earbuds, make sure to check it out now while the deal's running. Buyraycon.com slash brain brain and that's really about it and going yeah. on these hikes and mm -hmm. it was amazing yeah i mean and, and that's the thing man is that you get the best memories and the happiest moments from shit that's real like that yeah you know and and yeah i think uh people can be a really big factor too is like who you're around and who you're with when you're doing those things um but you know in the same breath I've had some incredible moments doing solo travel too. You're fucking nuts. I ain't doing that shit. I gotta be with people. With my type of luck, dude, I'm gonna get kidnapped. Well, not if you're in Japan, right? I can find a way. I'm also twice everybody's size in Japan. Nah, bro, like, look, man, uh, you know, the last most recent international travel I did was to Tokyo. It was my second time there. But this time around, rather than just doing Tokyo, I went to different parts of Japan. I made it a goal to see and experience other parts of Japan, right? So I think like the first third of the trip uh, was with friends. And then those friends had other things that they had to do. And then they left. And then so I spent the rest of the time by myself traveling basically on the Shinkansen to other places, yeah. you know? But man, like, I don't know, dude. There's just there's just this like, you just have these really visceral and like real moments where you're just like, 
in tune with yourself and, and like you have i can't it's hard for me to put into words but you feel like you feel this connection you're I so guess. lucky you don't have anxiety no no i i did that that's where i suffered my first almost anxiety attack too though oh really mm -hmm. why i was staying in uh hiroshima right mm -hmm. i was there for a night and i got this like uh, businessman hotel it's a chain of hotels in in uh in japan it's called apa i don't know okay. if you've ever seen them before mm -hmm. but basically it's it it just does a job it's for traveling businessmen who just need to a place, a place to, sleep. to sleep yeah yeah but it's not like a capsule hotel where it's super claustrophobic it's they have a bathroom you know they have a bed in a small little area tv but it's not that big right i was there and um i had my laptop and you know i was actually taking care of some work uh, for some secret society stuff and then everything's cool. I take a shower and I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to go to sleep. But as soon as I turned off the lights and laid down, my mind started going at like a million miles per hour. All the things I needed to do when I when I got back, mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the pl uh, trip that I had to plan, because I was playing everything by ear. I didn't yeah. have anything in, in uh, stone. And then my mind started racing and I felt legitimately felt for the first time in my life that i was gonna lose my fucking mind i thought i was gonna go crazy yeah. you know and my anxiety just started skyrocketing i fucking turn on the lights i had to open up the window to get some fresh air and i just ta started taking deep breaths and then i was able to calm down so I, I don't i mean i've had one more instance of that since then um but i think it's triggered by like anxiety and a feel of claustrophobia I developed mm. slight claustrophobia in my adult years. Never had a problem with it before. Um, oh, I can't be in small spaces. Was it always like that though? It was always like okay. that. Okay, so for me, it was like, I'll give you an example. I've gotten maybe about five MRIs in my life, right? Fifth one I got in my late 20s. That was the first time I felt a genuine, genuine sense of claustrophobia. Never felt it before, but... You know, they slide you in into there. The trick is to have your eyes closed all the way so Dude, you don't know when you're going in. Even even though my eyes were closed, man, I, I you could feel like the walls mm. are just there. And I think it's just, uh, you know, as I got older, more responsibilities, more anxiety, you know, yeah. it just probably factors to why that phobia developed. But I think it was triggered kind of by feeling like I'm in a tight space in that hotel. And the second time it happened was actually like a year ago. I was uh, getting, I was in a plane, uh, getting on a plane to go uh, on a bachelor trip. As I'm walking through the aisles, it was a full flight, jam fucking packing. I'm in literally the last row, right? As I'm walking, I'm starting to feel like, oh fuck, this is a super tight space. Yeah. And I'm feeling really crowded right now, really cramped up. I sit in my seat. I'm I'm in the aisle seat, but then there's a couple sitting in. So it's a it's a it's a, a full row too, right? This guy, part of his arm is kind of bleeding over onto my side, and then so as soon as I sit down, his arm is already on. I, I I'm like, oh shit, dude, I do not fucking feel comfortable right now, and then I started to feel that anxiety again, and. I got literally this close to telling the stewards, I need to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I, I need to get off this plane. I can't I can't go on this trip, you know? But started getting butt naked and screaming on <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. It's not it, look, when I'm having that that feeling of an anxiety attack, if you look at my face, I look completely normal. Mm -hmm. All of this shit's going on in my head. You're just screaming inside of your head. And, and no, I'm not screaming in my head. I'm in my head, I'm just like having a thousand thoughts going and I'm just like, I need to fucking get out of here, you know? Um so, you know, that's another thing I got to deal with now at this age. <laughs> anxiety sucks. I mean, uh, I started, I don't know if CBD really helps with my anxiety per se. I tried, dude. It, it didn't really do anything for but me. But you know what helps though? CBD what? with just a little THC. Oh, a little bit? Uh -huh. I need CBD with a small amount of THC. So I do a CBD with like five milligrams of THC. Okay. Okay. And it's just enough to where you could feel a slight buzz mm -hmm. but it's not enough to get you high mm. and that is the money okay that's the ticket right there yeah because i hate being high I yeah fucking hate it yeah so when i when i went to colorado yeah. you know you know people in colorado oh when yeah they at these weed shops oh yeah they, they talk about some fucking hocus pocus shit yeah you know what i mean yeah. like hey bro let me tell you something man when you hit this sat sativa <laughs> here the sativa the strain so okay let me just break down the chemical compound of this shit it's like yeah. bro, just give me some shit yeah, just recommend me some shit bro. so basically i told him i was like listen uh cbd kind of works 
Force helps me relax, but I need something a little stronger. He goes, mm-hmm. well, it's not about the potency of the, how much how many milligrams of CBD you're going to take. What you need to do is just have a small dose of THC because with THC, the CBD that, works a lot stronger. Yeah, that, that compound reaction. Exactly. Yeah. I had no fucking idea. Uh-huh. Well, I'm super weak against any type of THC. <laughs> so I, I remember I just had five milligrams. Yeah. Motherfucker, I was high as a kite. Really? And then... Um, it was weird because five milligrams is super small. Mm-hmm. But after I did it once and I did it a second time, mm-hmm. it wasn't as oh, okay. crazy. And okay. The third time I did it, it was like, oh, this well, is. Did perfect. you take an edible? Did you smoke it? What? Edible. Okay, an edible. So maybe you just ate a little bit too much your first time. Maybe. Maybe yeah. I had two gummies. I don't know. I'm kind of <laughs> fat. So I, I'd be doing some shit. So, <laughs> but five milligrams, I guess like a typical serving is usually 10. Mm-hmm. So it's half, mm-hmm. half of that. So I had five milligrams. And yeah. now when I take five milligrams, it helps me relax, but I'm still very cognizant. Mm. So um, definitely helps out with the anxiety shit, mm-hmm. which kind of blows my mind how long it took to legalize uh, medical marijuana. Yeah, I know. It's so helpful. I know, man. It Look, it treats so many different things, you know? Yeah. Um, and then look, the government uh, has been, uh, they've had uh, medical marijuana for a long time. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, well, if there's medicinal purposes for it and, and you are distributing it, then why can't it be just legal on a more general level? Why does it have to be so specific where the government can only, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I can't. I can't smoke weed anymore, bro. I tried a few years ago because um, you know I have trouble with sleeping. Yeah, and I didn't want to keep taking like synthetic. Yeah, you shit. just need to go get sunlight, motherfucker. <laughs> it ain't the sunlight, man. You gotta go it to sunlight, and you need to work out. Nah, you know what it is, man. It's uh, I just have a really active mind. I guarantee you, yeah. you do one kickboxing fucking <laughs> session with me, you won't be able to keep your fucking eyes open. You'll knock out instantly, dude. But like, even even when I've done, you know physically exhausting things right i will be absolutely dead physically Mm -hmm. but my mind at a certain point in time like usually around 12 a.m it gets very active i can't help it and i looked at looked at it um did some research on it and basically it's based on your circadian rhythm not everybody's circadian rhythm is the same yeah and some people is like i guess longer than others and so you kind of reset at some point and then once you hit that reset point, it's like your second win, right? Yeah. Or your third win. So that always happens to me. I, I might be fucking tired at like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., physically exhausted. If I sleep at that point, bro, for sure it's a nap. 10 out of 10. There's no way I'm sleeping through the rest of the night. That has never happened oh, in my life. If I, I'm, I'm like that too. So yeah. if, I, if I sleep like 30 minutes, mm-hmm. I'm going to be awake till the next day. Mm-hmm. So I... I purposely don't do it mm. at all yeah so even i found out recently i'm hyper i'm hyper responsive to caffeine mm-hmm. so i don't have i really i the only time i have caffeine now is it has to be in the a.m mm-hmm. and i need to do physical activity that day i see today i had caffeine yeah. i have no physical activity so yeah. i'm fucked <laughs> <laughs> so i gotta i gotta jack off like 30 times maybe, maybe I gotta we'll do <laughs> and then maybe just fall on my head down the stairs and see yeah. what happens <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I have, I just have a very active mind, man. And so I've always had trouble sleeping since I was, uh, like my teenage years, man. I've but you always... remember me and K-Town didn't sleep at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, do. We both didn't sleep yeah, at all. We yeah. just stayed up at night just fucking doing yeah, K-Town dude, shit. during that time, man, I mean, like I would average two to three hours of sleep and yeah. be completely fine, you know? I only stopped that recently. I stopped doing that probably in the last like two years, mm-hmm. maybe a year and a half. Because mm-hmm. I just do a lot of activity, get sunlight, no more caffeine, mm-hmm. and then I'll sleep like an average of five now. Yeah, so here's the thing now is that once I hit my 30s yeah. and I was doing that, half the time I would have a absolutely like nightmarish of a migraine. Uh, and so yep. it derails my whole fucking day. Yeah. And then so once that started happening, I was like, okay, well, that's another thing I have to adapt to now. Yeah. It's, a, it's a constant process of adaptation uh, or, or adapting. Have you, done a, have you done an overnight sleep study? I haven't. I should though. You should. Yeah. If you if you can't sleep, you really need to. So I, I did an overnight sleep study. So, okay. Um, it helps out. They mm-hmm. kind of figure out number one your circadian rhythm, mm-hmm. right? Um, how active your brain is when you sleep and all of this stuff. Because mm-hmm. I'm pretty active too. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things too, I get rid of my phone. Mm-hmm. That helps out a lot. Even mm-hmm. though I'm, I'm, when I have a thought, I'm so curious. I want to read up on it. <laughs> yeah. No, I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you're so, like you've been laying down for thirty minutes, and then you start thinking about something. You're like, no, I, I gotta find this I gotta, out right I, now. I, I really need to figure out what the fuck this shit yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that happened too was that uh, I started to realize how slow my brain is when I don't sleep. 
Mm. Um, like I can't recollect things very well. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's always been like that. I just kind of ignored it. Uh -huh. It just didn't really bother me. Yeah. But when I started having more responsibilities, I needed to be a lot more cognizant. So yeah. sleeping was a huge priority. Gotta be a little more sharpened on your toes. Exactly. Yeah. And so when, when I'm in these like high stress level situations and I can't use my brain and it doesn't function, mm -hmm. it would fuck up. When I first started this podcast, which was what, about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. I was having the worst sleep. And I remember when I was doing this podcast, I couldn't recollect <laughs> shit. I'm like, yeah, Yo. trouble thinking of words. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I'm like, you have to sleep, man. Yeah. You, you have to figure out a way to sleep. Yeah. For me anyways, it was, it wasn't just the activity part. It was, um, it was the sunlight part. So mm -hmm. now what I do is that during my daytime, so a lot of people think I have a lot of free time, but it's not that it's just, I flip my schedule. Yeah. So daytime, I have fun. Mm -hmm. So I exercise, mm -hmm. I bike, but once mm -hmm. it hits about 3 PM, mm -hmm. I'm working. So I work from three all the way to like one. Mm -hmm. So it's the, I do the opposite. So have I, have you tried masturbating in the sunlight too? So here, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> tell you something. That shit uh -huh. does not work. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't work. I masturbate oh, as I'm biking out in Venice beach and I just start spraying people in public. Just bow, 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 bitch. Biological weapon. And I really start to see what happens. <laughs> Shit. Well, let's get into the genius brain, uh, not advice, suggestion is suggestion what I call it. corner. Legal reasons. The suggestion is just to masturbate. That's Here we it. go. That's it. This one is titled Pathological Liar Breakup uh -huh. by say his last name. Mm -hmm. Sounds like pathological liar before you even start. He made I know, up this son of a bitch. <laughs> I don't even know what your avatar is. He made this shit up, bro. Hi, David. First off, I want to say thank you for this podcast. It really has changed my life and opened up my mind in so many ways. I have no idea why. Mm. <laughs> just kidding, guy. Um, please keep me anonymous or just call me Mac if that's cool. Oh, well, too late for that. <laughs> too late for that guy. Well, at least you didn't say your last name, so. Yeah. You know. And by the way, it's not even I fooled you guys. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, so it was a double fake name. Yeah. Let's call you Peter. All right. All right, we'll call you Peter. Yeah, Pedro. Anyways, uh, Peter. Mm-hmm. Here we go. This woman, please keep me not. Uh, I got out of a relationship with a pathological liar. This woman had literally lied about everything I knew about her. Oh, shit. From saying she was from Australia and faking an accent oh. for the duration of the relationship. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's already a nightmare Stop. right there. That's so fucking dope. Yeah. Um, not your situation, but I'm saying that that's pretty terrible. So from saying she was from Australia and faking an accent for the duration of the relationship. So she just, you just met her. She was like, good night, mate. <laughs> you want some strips on the Barbie? And you were like, yo, so she's, she's exotic. <laughs> <laughs> so who's your cousin? Steve Irwin. Uh, claiming we were having, uh, claiming we were having twins and then having a miscarriage. Oh no. Oh, what the fuck? Okay. Faking, this bitch is crazy. She's nuts. Yeah. Faking getting jumped in our apartment stairwell. Oh, <laughs> yo, this girl's insane. Wow. Uh, even gave herself bruises to make it seem so. Yo, dude, that's okay. Saying she was a part of a rich family that invested in schools in Australia, mm. claiming she had a Marine brother who died in Iraq. Bro, you didn't find any of these things odd. <laughs> It's just like layers and, and layers. I, it's just so many layers. This is the most ridiculous shit I've ever heard. Yeah. And I don't know. She's like, I've also fought dragons <laughs> many times. And I'm also from Ireland. <laughs> the scale on my back is from a red dragon. The last one in Ireland. His name was Mjotter. Uh, saying, saying I reminded her of him and found comfort in me because I'm also a Marine. The list goes on and on. This pussy must have been fantastic. That shit must have been a Wagyu beef pussy. Or the head game was just, you know. I know. And when she would deep throat me, she would never come up for breath because she told me she was a mermaid and she didn't need it. And the saliva kept her from breathing. Kept her breathing. I finally realized that these were all lies, finally. And I left the relationship. But the part I'm struggling with is how all the love that I had towards this woman was towards a person who doesn't exist. She had led this fake persona so well, and and now that I know the truth, it feels like the woman I loved died simply because she never existed in the first place. You got played, man. Mm -hmm. My dumbass never asked for pictures or sonograms of the pregnancy because she faked the physical signs so well. Stuck out her belly. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Yeah, I'm not laughing at you, man, but you got to realize this from an outside perspective. How ridiculous this sounds. So she's like super skinny. And then right when you walk by, she goes, oh, and she sticks out her gut. I planned it. Uh, it's like those people, you know, who could fill it nuts. with air to make it. Yeah. yeah. She's fucking nuts. Stuck out her belly, ate weird cravings randomly and would throw up and would 
and oh, wanted to wow. wait. Oh, wow. She made herself bulimic? Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> and wanted to wait until the second trimester to see the sonogram and show the family to it. So once she had the miscarriage, I processed it and dealt with it as a real thing. In fact, damn, bro, I am so sorry. Uh, and that it was all fake kills me. Even the paranoia I had when she had gotten jumped in our stairwell. <laughs> What, what is she? What the fuck? Like I don't. I, what the fuck is the backstory to that? I got, <laughs> no. I got jumped right now. What happened? So one day she just came home. Everything's perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah. You guys are happily married, pregnant, yeah. and then she was just like, "I got jumped outside," and she just started beating the shit out of herself. She, this shit. She sounds like she's a fucking you know psychopath along with a pa- uh, pathological liar. Yeah. Oh wow. Let's see this. Okay, so. She had lived the fake persona. Her belly ate weird random cravings. Uh, even the paranoia when when she had gotten jumped in our stairwell. The morning before she had been jumped, I had caught three people breaking into my car that morning, who I chased down to their car and they tried to run me over as they got away. I'm pretty she used that occurrence to her advantage to make it seem like we were getting targeted when she got jumped later <laughs> that day. Damn, this bitch is good, She's dude. A sociopath, man. She's fucking nuts, man. <laughs> hey, good for you chasing people down. I would have never done that. <laughs> Uh, I handled all of these things so well as they happened and thought only of supporting her through it. But to find out it was all false is something I have never thought of dealing with or prepared for. She was convinced. She even convinced me not to call the cops because she had her uncle who was high up in the Latin Kings to take. <laughs> how is she in? Bro. Oh my How the God. fuck is she from Australia and their fucking uncles are in, are yeah, in the I Latin know. Kings? How the fuck does that make sense, bro? <laughs> Well, see, the story is my... Dude, I can literally tell this guy anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not making fun of you, man, but you right. You're kind of dumb for this, but... Uh, you're a little bit gullible, man. A little gullible, man. She's like, <laughs> it's like we should call the cops. Oh, my uncle's in the Latin Kings. <laughs> we don't need to. Yeah. Uh, uncle was high up in the Latin Kings to take care of the people who jumped her and broke into my car. Watch, and she's, you were... not, watch she's not even Hispanic. She's I like know. Asian. <laughs> she's like, what are you? <laughs> I'm Filipino. <laughs> I'm so sorry to tell you this, but I'm, I'm from the Philippines. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> uncle was high up in the Latin First of all, you were okay with her uncles murdering people? You're oh, no. kind of nuts too, my guy. Uh, I have blocked her on everything, moved out, and cut contact completely. But do you have any advice on how to cope with falling in love with a fake person? Well, um, that has never happened to me. Yeah, I know that these things were. All, I know that these things were all her doing, but I feel guilt and not looking into all the. What, why feel guilt in these red flags and inconsistencies in her stories as they happen? She even posed as a surgical tech and <laughs> would put on scrubs and go to work. Oh wow! And even had gotten a hold of a parking tag for the hospital that she put on her truck. Wow! She never even had a job, and her dad was paying the other half of our rent. She claimed she was working on becoming a neurosurgeon. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is so hard to get through. Oh, bro. This is so ridiculous. It has to be true. Yeah. But but never had even been to school. I came to find out from her friends. So yeah, this bitch was crazy. I feel bad for her and that she, she she feels that she need to carry on this fake life as I know she'll put she'll only put herself in more pain and that she ever put it put me in. Thank God my ass escaped. But now I'm just heartbroken and that woman I love didn't even exist and that I went through so much painful events with her that didn't even happen. My ass got played so hard and I feel pow- powerless and gullible. Okay, guy. Well, Peter, let me just tell you something. Uh, most people, when they give advice, they like to say something nice. They say something, they critique after, and they say something nice after. Yeah. I have a shit sandwich, so I like to say something terrible first. You're the <laughs> dumbest motherfucker I've never met in my life. What is going on, guy? Listen, I know that love makes you blind, but yeah. motherfucker, you were never born with eyes. Yeah, bro. I mean, come on. There are so many red flags there where you should have taken a moment to quite. And you know what? I say this because I have experience with pathological liars. Mm-hmm. Um, my college roommate was a pathological liar. Remember I told you? Which one was this one? Uh, my college roommate, my freshman year. I got a random, paired with a random roommate. And this, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it didn't take long for me to be like, okay, this this dude is on some shit. Yeah. You know, he's on some other shit. That's right. <laughs> You're in a relationship with, I didn't even fucking have an intimate relationship with this guy and I saw all the red flags. You how know? good, how good was the pussy? Uh, like, how good was that shit? He, you know, here's the thing, man. Number one, let's just, okay, now that we said that, uh, beating yourself up for stuff that was, uh, I guess, in a sense, out of your control, there's no point to that shit. Yeah, Absolutely no point to that stuff. If yeah. anything else, you shouldn't look at this like, oh, I went through this real pain. You should say, oh, I didn't lose a child. Mm. This girl was fucking nuts. She played me. And now that I know that 
which I don't even know these are typical signs, <laughs> yeah. but now that you'll be a little more cautious about <laughs> yeah. this stuff, yeah. now you can start fresh. And it seems like you're pretty young anyways. So, I mean, what did you really lose? If anything else, you gained a really, really fun story. No, for sure. For sure. I mean, you are going to be able to look back on it and And all your friends laugh. are going to make fun of you for yeah, the rest for of your sure, life. For sure. But I don't know how fresh this <laughs> My uncle's My uncle's a part of the Latin Kings. He'll take care of him. He was like, all right. <laughs> Bro, I, yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Like, wait, what's wrong with you, guy? Yeah. Maybe you got some shit you got to fix yourself. Yeah. Uh, it's just I a mean, neurosurgeon. He, this guy, uh, I don't know how. I hope he's young because he does sound naive and, and gullible. But you even acknowledge you even acknowledge that you are. So, here's the thing. I don't know how fresh this is. Um, and so, regardless of the ridiculousness of the situation, you're still gonna feel what you feel. Yeah. But give it some time. You'll you'll definitely process through it. And then, like I said, you're gonna get to a point in the near future where you're gonna look back on it and actually laugh on it, be able to laugh yeah, on and it. I'm gonna make fun. Of, if I ever meet you in person, I'm gonna <laughs> laugh in your fucking face. You're a marine. You know better. Yeah. You've been through some shit. I mean, good lord, man, the layers to the deceit. That's that's on another. You know level. what would have just helped you out in general, bro? If you looked up something as simple as what does it take to be a neurosurgeon? <laughs> yeah. Do you know that that in in a, in like a fucking I don't know like a four hundred or seven hundred mile radius, mm -hmm. there's only one neurosurgeon. Yeah, it is not easy to become a neurosurgeon. It's actually the most difficult thing to become in the medical profession. To to his defense or in his defense it sounds like this bitch was really meticulous oh she with had the lies. medical shit and yeah, everything else yeah she it looked like she was really trying to cover her bait like this is on some catch me if you can shit yeah you know yeah, 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 yeah yeah like you're really going out of your oh, way she started giving herself bruises and beating yeah, her own ass yeah. it's so funny she beat her own ass that's yeah. hilarious and, and even to to find the hospital pass or even forged it for that matter yeah. who knows how she how she did it but dog you could be the best stand-up comic on earth <laughs> just to let you know like you're looking at this right now from a lens of I got played and I just got screwed over. Yeah. You should look at this as a lens of I survived this shit mm -hmm. and now I have the funniest fucking story. Yeah. Like you met a girl that literally beat her own ass. <laughs> I never. <laughs> she fucked herself yeah. up. Yeah. Like you gotta you gotta look at the dedication behind what she was doing. So don't beat yourself up too much about that. This bitch was on a mission to fool you and and she did. Um. But at the end of the day, it's like just try to have perspective on it you know and once you do get that perspective it is gonna be a fucking hilarious Dude, story the moment that you found out about all these lies you should have moved past the heartbreak and you should have had some fucking i'm fun. curious about how he found out though what what was what was the 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 moment where he's like hold up <laughs> i think it was the moment when she said that uh she had the cure to aids in her pussy and then he was like hold on a second maybe this isn't real let me, let me question everything you've said and <laughs> yeah, done now there are so many ridiculous shit that she said i'm sorry i I gotta read through some of this stuff again because well, so that's what makes me like super curious <laughs> is like what all those things he, he said are, are so ridiculous but there had to have been one exceptionally <laughs> ridiculous moment you know the australian accent part is the part that gets me the oh, most man. so she meets this guy and she goes hi good morning how are you and she just goes good night mike <laughs> dude I, that actually reminded me of a story, but yeah. <laughs> you read, read uh, what, what, what? No, you, I want to hear this story. <laughs> yeah, you want to hear? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, this was back in the day in, in K-Town, right? And uh, I'm with uh, some mutual friends. I told you this story before where uh, a, a particular YouTuber member got into a fight or was, was starting some shit uh, with... with by hollering at a girl. You remember this David story? David Choi. Yeah, I, call, I called him out on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that night, there was also a girl there, right? Um, I mean, one of uh, many girls, but I, I I started talking with her. And then uh, it reminds me because uh, she told me she's act because she had a regular LA accent. But then through talking, I found out that she's actually from Australia originally, or or so she says. And then so I was like, no fucking way. Your your accent sounds completely like LA, California. Um, I was like, let me let me hear your Australian accent. And then she was able to turn it on on and off at will. It, it's but it sounded legit, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm only I'm a, I'm a fucking layman to that. I, I don't know the intricacies yeah, of know. that accent, and plus, right? You know, you just met this person. You're you're inclined to believe what they're going to mm -hmm. say. Like, why so, would you be the asshole that says right. no fucking way? Right. Get the fuck so, out of my face. So the story. I got reminded of the story because of that Australian thing, the accent thing. Yeah. So I'm like, oh shit, you know, that's cool. Um, I think Australian accents are, are kind of hot in girls, right? 
And then, so anyway, long story short, uh, towards the end of the night, like probably like 2 a.m., uh, we still want to kick it. So we go to uh, Abe's place, actually. Um, that's when he was living in the same complex as me. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So we're at Abe's place and then we're basically there till like 4.30 or 5 in the morning. And then I'm like, all right, you know what? Um, I'm going to call it pretty tired. I'm going to, all I want to do right now is just take, go back, take a hot shower and get in my bed, yeah. you know, because I always got a shower before I get in my bed. Uh-huh. So I'm heading out and she's like, oh, actually, I think I'm going to head out too. And I'm like, okay, cool. And, and me being a gentleman, I'm like, I'll walk you down, right? Um, so we start heading to the elevator, we get down to the lobby. I'm like, all right, well, you know, so have a good night. And then she's like, oh, I actually have to use the restroom. And I'm like, bitch, you couldn't fucking tell me that before we got all the way down here. I'm like, all right, well, you could use, you know, my restroom at, at my place. Um, so we go back to my place, uh, I let her use the restroom and then she comes out and how about this bitch just goes straight to my bed, right? She goes straight to my bed and then she starts kind of like giggling and, you know, kind, kind of uh, trying to uh, fuck. pretty much trying to lure me in. Right. Yeah. But here's how raw I can be is that if I've already decided on something, you know, which in my mind at that point was I'm trying to take a hot shower and get in my bed. And you are presenting yourself as an obstacle to that. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. You get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I, and I swear to God, I, I looked at her. It is time for you to leave. No, I, I I looked at her like straight face. I said, listen, you want me to call you an Uber? You want me to drop you off at home? <laughs> her, Damn. Her, her expression changed like that, bro. She went from like giggling and flirty to like she was so stunned that I said that. But my thing was. I need you to get the fuck out of here. I'm still going to be a gentleman and offer you a ride, (laughs) but I want you to know you need to get the fuck up out of here. Right. And look, she was cute. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say she was like a a fucking nasty girl. And I was just like, that's why it's just, she was inconveniencing me in that moment. That's the gayest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now it's the straightest thing. That's the gayest thing I've ever heard in my life, man. And I don't mean that in a gay way. I mean, that that's the gayest thing I've ever heard in my life. And she, I guess, you know, she felt like so stupid. You you made her feel ugly. She was like, ah, I think I left my phone, you know, at, at Abe's place. I was like, you want me to help you look for it? Because <laughs> whatever's going to expedite this to that, you. That girl is now a stripper <laughs> or a prostitute because you just but completely dog, obliterated that, that's her. The thing, that's the how thing. Fuck, I would that, never have done that's, that. That's always been how I am, though. I don't give a fuck about pussy if I don't give a fuck about it in that moment. You know oh, what I mean? me. If, that, if I walked up and this girl's like, ah, I'm yeah. like, you definitely did for a reason. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Nah. I, I, it was always for me about like, is this convenient to me or not? You know? And if it's not, I don't give a fuck, man. I don't give a fuck. Oh, should I tell the story? (laughs) We're friends. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'm not saying that. Well, this is different though, right? Because number one, Uh I at the time was with somebody. I'm Mm -hmm. a very faithful person. I've Mm -hmm. never cheated on a girl in my fucking Mm -hmm. life ever. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) Kate was actually there. Uh Uh-huh. This fucking bitch. So I had not seen this girl in a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, I, I'll, I'll tell you who it is after, okay. but you know, Kay knows who it is. Okay. But um, so she was visiting in town because uh, she was gonna go away for a while, right? Yeah. I hadn't seen this girl in a very long time. Now, prior to this, I was very flirtatious with her, but mm-hmm. I was, I was in More like a, a friendly. Flirtatious, good, good flirtatious, and you know we made out a couple times. Okay, <laughs> she, you know, but we never, but we never, we never hooked up. Yeah, yeah, nothing like that, right? Yeah. I never sealed the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because we we kind of teetered on that weird line of friendship and flirting, yeah, right? Yeah, and if you kind of move past that, it just gets a little too right, weird. Right, so it right. never went that way. Um, and plus, she didn't she didn't live here. She lived she lived in another city, mm-hmm. uh, another state actually. Mm. So she. <laughs> she wanted to meet up and she loves this restaurant specifically out in Glendale. Mm-hmm. And uh, I asked Kay to come along too mm-hmm. because I didn't feel comfortable. Yeah, being yeah, with yeah. Because we're still friends. Yeah. But because of our history, I wanted yeah. to be respectful enough to the person that I Maintain was with. Maintain a friendly environment. Exactly. So <laughs> um, when we went to go meet up to go eat, yeah. uh, 
I completely walked past her. Mm. And the reason why I walked past her is because I couldn't recognize her. Mm. She had gained an absorbent amount of weight. <laughs> and I'm not saying she's unattractive because she's a thick girl. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't recognize right. her. It's like she went swimming in a saltwater pool and stayed there for six years. So she blew up, <laughs> yeah. right? I hadn't seen her in a hot second. Yeah. And Khalif was laughing uh -huh. because he knew how much weight she had gained mm -hmm. and the fact that I didn't, and I just literally walked right past her. Mm -hmm. She goes, um, hello. Mm -hmm. Like, how have you been? I'm yeah. like, who the fuck is this girl that ate my friend? <laughs> you know? So this whole time we're, we're, we're at this restaurant yeah. and Khalif is trying not to laugh. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of how different she looks mm -hmm. and how I was just so shocked. I couldn't get the shock rid of, rid of my, uh, out of my face. But long story short, we end up going, going back to my place. Yeah. And this is the, this is the apartment that I lived in with, with Kay and everybody. Oh, right? Okay. Okay. So we were chilling yeah. and this girl was doing that type of shit, right? Mm -hmm. Super kind of flirtatious yeah. and kind of being really weird about it. But number one, I am, I am faithful as fuck. Yeah. And I'm also not attracted to her. Yeah. Right. There's a reason why we never continued it further. So nothing was going to happen. Yeah. So, <laughs> Fucking Khalif being the bitch ass motherfucker that he is, right? I expected him to stay throughout the night, yeah. right? So before she was going to leave. Uh -huh. So Khalif is a bitch because he up he up and leaves. Yeah. Because she wanted to come over and hang out a little before she was going to fly out. So uh -huh. he's like, hey, I got to go out. You uh -huh. know, and at the time he was dating Dia. Uh -huh. So he's like, yo, I'm going to leave Dia's calling. I'm like, yeah. No, she's not, bro. He fucking leaves me. And so this whole t whole time, she's like, yeah, it's getting really super late at night. I'm getting super sleepy, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And you know, in my living room, I, I used to have this white day bed mm -hmm. that people used to crash on. Yeah, yeah. So this girl, and I'm telling her, like, I'm giving her the signs that, yo, she should probably leave. Mm -hmm. She starts going under the covers, mm -hmm. right? And starts flirting, putting her foot on me and shit. I'm like, this is not going to happen. Yeah. Now, I didn't do something as disrespectful as you. <laughs> it's you not said, disrespectful. It was very respectful. Are you going to call just raw. <laughs> I, I didn't do something as disrespectful as you. I did something 10 times worse. <laughs> Dog. Because we're friends too. Yeah, and you know yeah. how I joke around with my friends. You even yeah. saw how I how I you know used to clown on my ex-girlfriend. Like yeah. I, I joke like that. Yeah. Dog. I fucking pulled that blanket off of her like I was doing a fucking magic trick on a dining table. I said, What? I was like, it's time for you to leave. And she's yeah. like, why? It's too late. I can't drive back home. Yeah. I was like, how far is your hotel? Yeah. She's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, no, it's yeah, time for you, you to know. go home. You know. I whipped that blanket off of her like what up super fast i was yeah. like it's time for you to fucking leave yeah me. but it's it's weird i'm not saying that if i was single though yeah completely different story okay okay if i was single yeah different because you were single at yeah, the time i was i was single but but here's the thing there, there's a rip or a layer to that story that i didn't mention was that she was also uh really offending me because who the fuck said you could get on my bed with your fucking dirty ass? I don't know where the fuck you've been. Yeah, and I'm OCD, bro. The bed is a clean zone. The bed is if you get in the bed, you gotta be washed up and showered. It, that that's that's my rule to get into the bed. You, you know? why? It's because you don't drink. <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> I know. I know. If you were drinking, it'd be a completely different I story. I don't know none of that uh, shit. I know. Um, but bro, that was the thing. Is that all right? One. You're inconveniencing me because I need to fucking shower right now and I want to get in the bed. You Two, just, who the fuck said you can get in my bed? As a single man, that's not what have happened to me. <laughs> First of all, women never threw themselves out, that, threw, threw themselves out ever. That's not the thought process that usually goes through a single man's mind. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Especially but, when the girl knows that she's just looking for fun. Yeah. You hurt her feelings. You're a terrible I, person. I mean, look, man, but I was respectful about it. You know, I offered her to call an Uber or I give hope, her a ride. You know I what really I mean? I hope that my friend is not listening to this, but you know what you did. <laughs> hey, you but you know, your your story is complete. I don't think it's, it's, it's a, a ridiculous story to tell because- you were in a relationship. Yes. And you were drawing a hard line in the sand. And you guys already had that friendly relationship with that girl. And it didn't work out. Yeah. And it's like, look, you need to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I, I, I got to so, do. I really wanted to put in the sketch because I literally ripped that blanket off her. I said, nope. What? <laughs> <laughs> time for you to go, girl. It's like instant, you know. I, like, I, I have no feelings towards you. Yeah. It's time for you to leave. Well, that and a little bit of... um kind of shame on her uh for you know trying to engage yeah, but you know but you know guys are super trifling dude i know a lot of homies that step out on their way oh for sure all for the sure. fucking for time sure. so for sure. it's it's not even like but it's like trifling meets trifling yeah you, you know, know what i mean yeah and you, I, you, there has to be an initiation into that trifle mode for sure 
<laughs> I'm just not a trifling ass dude. Yeah. Specifically because I never got a lot of women growing up. So the women that I have, I keep them really tight to me. I'm oh, like, no, I can't man. lose you. What the fuck? <laughs> You know, <laughs> I was like, this, this was this happened by chance and God's grace. I'm not screwing this up. This is the, this is the man who who uh, falls to the floor and grabs grabs their ankles and their knees. Yep, because you know what happened with my first girlfriend. I fucking grabbed her ankles like like a bunch of shackles. Oh, like I was man. like, please don't fucking leave me. Oh man, I've had I've had I think a pretty good amount of those type of moments in my life where this girl wanted something but was also inconveniencing me. And so I just shut that shit down. And it's like, look, man, I'm being straight up. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not like saying, you know, being offensive to her or being disrespectful. I mean, I don't think it's disrespectful to say, you know, I mean, no, it's not disrespectful, yeah. but I'm it's pretty raw. sure I'm pretty it's sure raw dog for sure. I'm pretty sure her self-esteem was shot. Like oh, a yeah. I mean, you could see it in the face. Yeah. It looked like just her world fucking broke apart in that moment. I could never tell a story like that because that would have never happened that way ever. <laughs> absolutely not sometimes a girl would just like breathe on me and i'm like would you like to speak and she goes no i'm just breathing bro i'm like okay i just assumed and i just walk away i'm like all right he just breathes on you you want to get married <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're trying to get married yeah are you, right are you, are you trying are, to be my is wife this, is this is this is this happening so what do you mean is this happening <laughs> she's like what do you mean what's happening zero to a million real quick yeah she just says hi to me. She turns yeah. around and right yeah. when she comes back, she has a ring on her finger and I have a child in my hand. I'm like, this is yours. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, it's like, like I said, in that moment, I have an objective and and she was infringing on that. Oh, I, I let me tell you something. If I, if I was single at the time and there mm -hmm. was a cute Korean girl that rolled into my bed, right? Mm -hmm. My mom could call say, listen, I'm getting robbed right now. I was like, hold up, mom, give me about th 30 seconds. That's all I need. I need 30 oh seconds. My God. <laughs> I need 30 seconds to finish this off. I'll give you a call back. Yeah. I'll make it happen. No, no. The, my brain operates in a little bit of a different way. Uh, I guess part of it makes me, me, you know? <laughs> I, I have very weird quirks like that. Where it's like, look, man, you're fucking getting in the way of something I'm trying to do right now. And you know what's weird, too? I'm, I always get so upset because I don't know if, if a woman could go ahead and attest to this, but any time that I have been approached by a woman mm -hmm. that was more forward than rather than me having to chase, because I'm always a chaser, mm -hmm. uh, it always happened when I was in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because when guys are in a relationship, they, they don't give off these weird, like, desperate vibes mm -hmm. or they're not trying to mack on you all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something happens there, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. But that it's only happened when I was in a committed relationship or I was talking to somebody. Yeah. But when I'm single, <laughs> nothing. Like, the two opposite mags that push yeah. away from each other. <laughs> no, I, I definitely uh, know what you're talking about, though, in terms of when you are in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you're just giving off a different vibe or energy, but, you know, the same... I would say comparable things have happened just as much as when I'm single too, though. You know, dude, one time I was wingmanning for a friend, right, uh, in K-Town. Yeah, because this motherfucker is is uh, too much of a puss to, to get up and talk to a girl. So I'm like, man, I'll fucking wingman. I'll, I'll wingman for you so you can engage this girl because she was sitting with the friend. And then um, the girl I was talking to, I mean, she looked fucking ratchet as hell. I mean, she had big ass fake titties and she was just kind of on that uh import model look mm -hmm. you know but she was mixed so the hot factor was was definitely there um i wouldn't say it's my cup of tea but i think most single guys if they had an opportunity to just hook up with that uh, with a girl like that just like, say my name dude yeah <laughs> <laughs> just just say my name no but but like we started talking and and um you know i'm just like looking at my friend to see how he's progressing and no joke within 10 minutes like she starts doing this around my thighs, right? She gets real close. Oh my God. Yeah, dude. she gets real close and whispers in my ear, I'd fuck you right now. I've never again. had a single woman say that to me ever. That that was that was the most like raw approach a girl has ever taken. What taste, is that like? To, to straight up I've say- I've had a girl come up to me, whisper me and be like, can you please get my car? <laughs> they think I'm valet. <laughs> I've never, I've never had that happen to me before. Well, yeah, that that was that was the only time I've had some uh, like a girl be that raw with that straight up like I'd fuck you right now, you know. And I was like, 
Come again? <laughs> Come again? Yeah, is that... Did, <laughs> did you, you said, just say what I thought you said? <laughs> then you said, but don't you ever fucking go into my bed with outside clothes. <laughs> you understand? You fucking... Let- know, on the way home. Hey, let me let me fucking tell you, you something. You lecherous whore. <laughs> don't you dare ever. First thing you do when we get back is you taking a fucking shower. <laughs> yeah. You take a shower and you bathe yourself. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't do anything with it because I just was not interested, you know? Um, what happened to your buddy? Oh, so... I told my buddy, like, not too long after that moment, I was like, okay, we're going to fucking go out. And I was still smoking at that time. So I was like, let's go out and get a smoke, right? Let's, let's uh, do do a little progress update. I was like, hey, so how's it going, man? Like, are you, are you making some progress? He said, yeah, you know, I told her I'm going to take her to Disneyland. I was like, what the f- What? what? <laughs> I was like, who the fuck says you're going to take a girl to Disneyland where you're trying to... Uh, I, and I started cracking up and I'm like, okay. And, and she, she was receptive to that. And he's like, well, I offered because she said she'd never been to Disneyland before. Yeah. But that's not a date type of situation. No, it's mean? not. It's not. But he's the type where he's not like really looking to hook up. You know, he wants a relationship yeah, he's, at a bar, bro. Yeah, the fuck are you doing? Well, that's the thing. He, he has unrealistic expectations of where he thinks, yeah. you know, these things are going to happen. And so he just thought she was really cute and his intentions are always pure. Like, Oh, I want to date you and maybe get into a relate. It's not like, oh, I want to, I just want to fuck, you know, and, and then just go our own way. I don't think I've ever been to a bar situation where mm-hmm. I looked at a girl mm-hmm. and I'm like falling in love with them. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like it's just going to a bar just to have a dope conversation and then mm-hmm. you see what happens. Yeah. That's really about no, for it. For sure. For sure. Dude, look, there has been plenty of times where I met really cool girls at bars who might not be in like, you know, trying to get ratchet or whatever. Maybe their friends are trying to get ratchet and she's kind of, you know, just trying to chill and just uh, be out there with her friends. And and same thing for me. I don't drink, so I'm out. My friends might be, you know, getting, they're, they're just trying to fucking get drunk. Yeah, I'm just chilling, right? Having a good time, socializing, whatever. And then I'll have conversations with these people. Um, and I'm like, man, you're really cool. Dude, I don't even think I know because I've been with Mario for six years now. If mm-hmm. you throw me in a situation, like let's say like a social experiment, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you say, hey, yo, David, you're going to go to the bar and start talking to women. I don't know what to do anymore. Nah, that's not I'll, true, bro. I'll, I'll, I, get, I'll get locked up. No, because the thing is, it's like an ability to talk uh, is, I feel like, just innate. It's an innate ability, you know? Um, sure, you can learn it too, but you, you just have to have a knack for it. Once you have that, no matter how long it's been or no matter how much rust is set in, I, I firmly believe you can get back into the rhythm just like that. You know, just goes like, I like, I like, I like your boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck, too forward. <laughs> I hope it's not the case. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I told Burial, if she fucking leaves me now, I'm fucked. Like, nah. I'm just, I, I, I think it's because I don't have that willpower. Because I know before, it, there was like a, there was a purpose, right? So yeah, you yeah, go yeah. Out, I was like, yo, I'm going to talk to some girls. I'm going to get rejected, but who That's the fuck just cares? what you say now, though, because you're not in that situation. There's no, it's not a push, come to shove type situation. You're just thinking, I'm comfortable. I love this woman. I'm imagining a future with this woman, building a family with this woman. That's that's in your head, mm. right? God forbid if if something goes south, right? And you guys end up- uh, you Oh, know, I told her if she leaves me, I'm going to die. So <laughs> I'm, I told her you're going to have that on your conscience. So just watch, you leave me. You're, you're, my life is in your hands, but you think about that. <laughs> that's- <laughs> I don't care. I got I to gotta sink my teeth in, dude. Oh my God. But what if, what if uh, you end up leaving her? Oh, impossible. Hey- you never know. You Absolutely know. not. I mean, look, I, I, I'm i just saying that it's very unlikely that Listen, you guys are going to split. I hate this girl. I still, I'm, still, I'm still with her. I fucking hate her guts. I'm not going anywhere, dude. Sometimes I look at her, I just go, he done. Sh-. <laughs> <laughs> I look at her sometimes when I wake up, I'm like, I look at this fucking for the rest oh of my life. Oh my God. It's like, ugh. Oh, yeah. You make me so happy. And I don't know why. <laughs> you fucking make me you so happy. You fulfill me on some level, but it makes me feel different dirty yeah. so <laughs> i haven't gone anywhere since some forbidden fruit yeah, that i'm biting something into. about you that i just i love being around it but god damn it you piss oh, me off oh man no but that's the thing i i i don't think that you have any lack of options bro if you were to ever become single again you know you know what the funny thing yeah. is i i know that people who when they when they go <laughs> their breakup phase mm-hmm. they start fucking you know working out start looking good yeah i'm gonna be the exact opposite i'm getting 70 pounds back <laughs> just getting your feelings all my acne's coming back <laughs> yeah. but your boy's r&b music about to be fire as fuck <laughs> but i'm about to look hideous 
I, I, I've, I've never had a sense of that. Like when um, you're heartless, dude. Uh -huh. well, you're, you're heartless, dude. I can be. I can be. It, it, <laughs> I can be perceived as heartless, but. I told you, man. It's just like, look, man. It's an inefficient use of time to, to like, you guy. know, you fucking robot, dude. You fucking made by Andrew Yang. <laughs> you fucking AI fuck. How dare you? <laughs> I have to feel things, man. I look. I feel. Things I saw a too. homeless dude yesterday. I teared up. I was like, you were somebody's baby. <laughs> I mean, look, man. I, I I I feel that compassion and all of that too, but I just process it differently in terms of when it's time to move on from something. You just fucking do it, you know? You just do it, man. Dude, man, I can't believe I can't believe you right now, man. I can't I hope one day that you you find somebody that you're just madly in love with that just ticks every single box that you want in a person. It just breaks and my heart. And then she fucking looks at somebody else and goes, You know what? You're not man enough for me. And she breaks your fucking heart. You know, but the thing is, I would have my way of coping with that and dealing with that and moving on though you know i don't think there would be any circumstance where i would just get into like this you know movie like scenario where i'm just Fine, this girl that ticks every single box that you uh -huh. have right uh -huh. it's perfect uh -huh. you nag her about going to the beach because you wanted to go chill that day she goes fine let's go yeah she walks out to get to her car car hits her she dies <laughs> I hope you feel that okay. type of pain. <laughs> That's pretty fucking devastating, bro. Come on, man. That's, that's cold. Oh, that's, that that, happens that is cold-blooded, man. Oh, and I, you I want to see you try to compart compartmentalize bro, that. I've, I've, dude, I know somebody where something similar like that happened to them, oh, man. Yeah, that's... that's Dude, it's 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 a fucking like one of the worst things, man. You can see. I know if Mariel died because mm -hmm. of some crazy shit, mm -hmm. I I think I could a hundred percent say I probably would just be single for the rest of my life, mm. only because I don't have closure. Mm. You know, because now it's we didn't we didn't end things on a note because we found out that we weren't compatible for each other. Yeah, is the person that I assumed to be compatible with for the rest of my life just died and left. Yeah, it's out so of your control. It was out, it's out of my control. Yeah. So I don't know how I would find closure i'm saying this i, I i'm not god forbid this ever happens but right 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 let's say she does pass away suddenly mm -hmm. your boy might have to be single for a while and just be the uh the the fun uncle wearing these every day yep. <laughs> just not ever finding love ever again do, do you think it would i mean obviously it's going to impact you in a huge way but do you think it would impact you in the sense of like it carries over to your responsibilities and you neglecting them as well. Oh, a hundred percent, dude. I, not, I would never create anything ever again. Mm. I say this because I'm a very dramatic human being, yeah, yeah. but I, I don't see myself dealing with that very well at all. Like, yeah. honestly, I would rather just disappear and have never, and nobody know me ever again because wow. I just don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause if I'm already emotionally volatile mm -hmm. uh, because of that, imagine what just being on a social media space would do to me. Right. I just don't want to hear it. I don't, yeah. I wouldn't want to hear, I'm sorry for your, I don't want to hear none of that shit yeah yeah i would just disappear off to a mountainside for maybe for a few <laughs> years come back and then maybe have a conversation with somebody just to level it out <laughs> i'll be a wolf boy i'll be eating fucking oh, live flesh man <laughs> i can't deal with i can't deal with shit like that yeah i mean i look i've never personally had a situation like that so it's hard to say and it's hard to imagine what that would feel like but it must be just one of the like most excruciating and like difficult things to, oh, to go 100%, through. Oh, hundred percent, man. To have something like that, a relationship that you develop for your whole life to figure out like, yo, this is the person that I could see myself with for the rest of my life. And then boom, it gets taken away from you yeah. at an early age. Yeah. It sucks. Like yeah. if I had, let's say Mary and I are together, right? And obviously even more so if we have a kid, I definitely wouldn't get with somebody else after mm -hmm. that. I would just dedicate my life to that child. But mm -hmm. at least I have this child so to, to remind me mm -hmm. of the love that I had with this woman. Mm -hmm. But let's say right now, a meteor strikes and then Mariel is gone. Mm -hmm. Your boy's going to be gone for a hot minute. Yeah, no, I mean, dude, I'm, I'm sure it, it fucks up the average person in a pretty big, like what I was alluding to earlier, where like I have an, uh, an acquaintance who like his girl, while he was on the phone with her, uh, got into an accident and died while on the phone together, you know? And like, from what I hear and what I, what I see is it, it fucked him up pretty good. You know, I don't think he's ever been the same after that. She wasn't on Bluetooth. I, I no, it wasn't because she was like not paying attention. Oh. I think it's somebody else's fault. You know, you just never know, man. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. Yeah. So like, can you imagine that shit, dude? Talking. That's a Korean drama shit. That is some Korean drama shit. 
Um, so fuck, man, I can't, I can't even imagine, you know, what that, what that must feel like. That's why I have a Toyota 4Runner. <laughs> so everybody try to hit you, you you're you going to take the damage. Yeah, you're going to die. A hundred percent. Just uh, well, a couple of months ago, this Tesla rear-ended me, mm. that Tesla got obliterated. <laughs> yeah. My car, fine. Yeah, a hundred percent fine. Yeah, it's like it's like those fucking Ford pickup trucks, man. Where it's like, yep, yeah. If if a Civic hits that thing, oh my god, Dude, that, you, yeah. I cannot wait till you guys see what I do to this fucking Forerunner, man. That shit's gonna look like it's ready for the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, you're gonna soup it up like a fucking tank? Oh, I got some shit ready for it, man. I want people to, I want people to assume that I'm a racist white person when I come out this truck, <laughs> but it's this fucking gooky little chinky little Korean guy. Are you getting? Well, no, no, not. Are you getting ready? I want to know this. Do you think you could handle an apocalypse? No. Like a zombie apocalypse. I kill myself instantly. Really? For sure, dude. I dude, this is this is how little self-control and strength I have as a human being. Mm-hmm. I told you a month ago I was gonna lose weight. I've mm-hmm. gained five pounds. <laughs> Dog. I gained weight. <laughs> and we've eaten Popeyes and McDonald's together since then. Yeah. This <laughs> has happened. This has happened. <laughs> and and this survive. is going on again. Well, yeah. One sandal. <laughs> what? Doc, I'm it a together, hot mess, bro. man. Yeah. You think I'm a survival of the apocalypse? Are you I, crazy? I take that question. But <laughs> Doc, if anything else, I'm the first person to go, man. Oh, I can't man. survive this shit. And with, with my anxiety? Oh, my God. I'm fucked, dude. <laughs> I definitely could live without a lot of things, but mm-hmm. if I don't, if I know for a fact that the only thing I'm doing to to live is just to survive, mm-hmm. I don't want to be a part of this world uh. anymore. Fuck that, dude. The, to live just only to be alive is mm-hmm. is the most frightening thing ever. It I, scares me, I, and I think that's that's why kind of the times right now has fucked up a lot of people. You know, fucked up their their mental health. It's oh, just, it fucked me up too, man. Yeah, I mean, because at some points it really did feel like that. You're just living to survive. Fuck you know. That. Yeah, and and it's like, what what the fuck is going on? You know, like you're you, what what you're used to, uh, what you're used to on a daily basis, what your normal day is like. All of a sudden, that does not exist, and it's like you have to be careful about everything you're doing. You know, and you have to limit, if not just completely eliminate contact with other people. I guarantee it, man. Yeah, it's it's hard shit, dude. I. I only because I know what it's like to wake up without a purpose, mm-hmm. and there was some of the worst, uh, worst days of my life. Mm. I just can't, I can't feel like that. Yeah, like only until recently. I, I like today. I made a YouTube video, which mm-hmm. I haven't done in a while, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna start. What, what kind of YouTube video? Just vlogging. Oh, but just I'm vlogging. gonna do it okay. in a very fun way that mm-hmm. I enjoy. Mm-hmm. And what I found out too was that because I'm waiting to do something amazing every time, mm-hmm. and. I'm just staying inactive because yeah. the pieces aren't there. So mm-hmm. I'm just not doing anything. Mm-hmm. I'm not creating anything at all. So it, it kind of, it makes me, makes it stagnant. My art's very stagnant. Right, right. And I'm waiting for this piece to be perfect. Like for example, I had this, I had this idea that mm-hmm. I want to shoot, mm-hmm. um, which is like a, a short web series, but how can I shoot it when we're in a quarantine? Right. I have to wait like another year. Right. Um, or get creative with how you would do it, right? Well, yeah, yeah. but it, at the end of the day, it, you need a crew with this. Like, yeah. There's no way you could do it by yourself. And I need I need, and I need, uh, um, actors and actresses. Mm. And I'm not going to be around fucking 10, 20 people who I don't know. Yeah. You so, know, the, 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 since you brought that up, it reminded me of uh, something I was uh, thinking about recently is that you know, because yeah, these days you have a lot of time with your thoughts, right? And I think it's a combination of that and the current age that we're at too, Mm -hmm. is that, you know, we're not, I mean, yeah, we are still in our prime technically, but we can't be young and reckless, you know? You got to be young and responsible now, right? Mm -hmm. I started to think about like, I guess, failed potentials and opportunities slash missed potentials and opportunities. The fact that as you get older, those opportunities and those potentials, the window on them close, you know? Yeah. It becomes more and more unrealistic for you to not only be able to re- revisit it, but to really put your heart and soul into it, time, energy, dedicate yourself to it and have a chance of achieving some semblance of success. And that really like terrified me, man, was like, cause I'm still single, you know? Yeah, I'm in a relationship, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have a family. I don't have a wife, right? And so for the most part, my time can be more flexible than somebody who's settled down in a family setting. 
Yet, at the same time, I can't do the same things that I did when I was 25. Yeah. You know, in, in my 20s. And I and not only that, I can't do it the same way even if I wanted to. And then so like this idea of like, man, what if I get to like 40, 45? At that point, I have a family. All these things that I've wanted to do or that I was doing and I can't do it anymore. That shit is fucking terrifying to me, dude. Because so much yeah. of my purpose is tied to that, you know? Yeah, I think for me, I kind of look at those things as just new chapters, mm -hmm. and I'll just be able to do whatever the fuck I want because of who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm because I'm I'm not saying I'm gonna be a, a reckless, irresponsible person, yeah. right? But I do know that I think sometimes developing a family and having a kid feels like you are losing a huge part of yourself for certain people. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just another chapter, right? Yeah. And, um, it's just it's just adding another layer to your life that makes things a lot difficult. Mm -hmm. But I I think we'll both be surprised how our what we fulfill ourselves with might shift and change. No, for sure, for right? sure. Yeah, and in that sense, I agree wholeheartedly. Right? Is that yeah? You have that new chapter, and within that chapter, there are new things, new experiences, and new joys to experience in that part of your life. But within that, also, you might still have these old burning desires that have not been explored to the extent that you would like to. And so what I'm saying is things like, for example, let's say you want to be like an artist of some sort, or you want to start your own business, right? Before, if you're single, yeah, you can live broke. You can live a struggling life, make major sacrifices and just do it. Bite the bullet, grind it out and just go. But then when you have a wife and kid or kids in the picture, that doesn't become so realistic. You might find the partner who might be down for that, but most of the time, I'm gonna assume that that is not a situation that's gonna be accepted. Yeah, I, you know, I I, I I I could definitely see that, and I do understand that. I yeah. think just for me, like for example, mm -hmm. I I am always scared of that, right? Not mm -hmm. being able to do the things I want, specifically because maybe finances might be the thing that kind of restricts me from doing right. the things that I want to do in life. Right. But that's why I started opening up businesses on mm -hmm. the side when money was really good. Mm -hmm. And mind you, those years when I was trying to make as much money as possible, mm -hmm. fuck, I was miserable, dude. Yeah, Man, yeah. It was miserable. Yeah. But because of that, those opportunities, I started, you know, developing these businesses so later on i'll be able to cash out and mm -hmm. if i if i do need this money mm -hmm. uh, that it is going to come in or i could sell my shares off and then i could walk away with a fat amount fat yeah. amount of cash yeah so I'm, I'm always making sure that i don't have to be in that type of situation mm -hmm. i think the hard part is when when we talk about you know these type of scenarios we also have to be very smart about how we want to set it up so for example a lot of people know that I didn't want to do YouTube for this long, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to do things outside of it. Yeah. Now, this is neither here nor there. Obviously, my my goals changed or whatever. But there was a certain point I was just doing YouTube because it was a good paycheck because I knew I needed the money to be financially secure and stable so I could do something else I wanted to do later in life. Absolutely. And that's 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 hard for an artist to really do that. It, it unless you're somebody who really loves art and likes creating all the time, it's very difficult for somebody to do that. For me, it was killing me on the inside. Mm -hmm. It was really, yeah, I really remember. fucking hard. Yeah. You know, um, that's why now too, when people look at this channel, they're like, yeah, you could do more stuff and make money. I I just move past that now. Mm -hmm. Like I'm kind of set myself up now where financially I'm okay and you know I'm not rich or balling, but I'm a lot happier. Yeah. So. Um, I, I just had to make that shift where I had to bite this bullet. So I don't, I'm not in a situation where I feel like later on in the future, I feel like I have to be strapped down financially to, and give up my dreams for something else. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard for people to kind of move past that first part where they have to do the stuff that makes them unhappy first to be happy later on. Right. You know? Yeah. No, it's definitely a learning and growing process for sure. I mean, because my thoughts and, and my perspective on it now can easily change, you know, in the next month, in the next year, in the next mm -hmm. few years, who knows, right? But it was just um, a current thought that I had. And, yeah. and, and like thinking about that terrified me. I'm like, fuck, man, unfulfilled desires and unfulfilled happiness is, is like the worst thing possible. Well, what's your desire right now then? Well, that's the thing is that I told you, like even music, I didn't step away from it because I was like, I'm done with this. Yeah. You know, I didn't say it wasn't like a, a conscious decision where I'm like, okay, I got to move past this now and I got to start, you know, doing real serious stuff. It, just that, that, that creativity well went dry, at least for that period. But then 
it's like now at the point I'm at, even if I want to like commit a certain amount of time and energy to it, it's limited. I can't, I can't do it on the level that I would like to. And then so in that sense, it would be purely for myself uh, in terms of getting that fulfillment that I'm looking for, but it wouldn't be at the pace that I would want, uh, like it to be. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, you gotta make these compromises. And, that, yeah. and I feel like that becomes inevitable and forced almost as you progress in life because your circumstances change, your responsibilities change, and age has a big factor to do with that. Yeah, but those those compromises too are, it, it, compromises to me are never looked at in a sense of I'm I'm doing I'm taking something away from me mm -hmm. so I can get something else. It's more like I'm I'm meeting in the middle so like I have something better than I would have had separately with those two things. Right? Yeah, yeah. So for example, like if if I was really about let's say I I wanted to delve into just the art alone, mm -hmm. that's easy shit for me in the sense of how to get to that route. Yeah, I would leave Mariel. Mm -hmm. I mean. It's facts, right? Right. Like right, I would, right. I would, I would right. leave her. Yeah. I would stay in my room. I would create. I would go travel. I would do the craziest fucking things to collect more stories. Yeah. Smooth with these writers and artists and do all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. If that was my true goal, right, 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 right. If that's what's something that I really, really feel that I, I'm going that I need in order to look back at my life and say that I'm happy, I can make these things happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay with having a little bit of that. Not even just okay. I'm happier having a little bit of this artist side. And being able to create while keeping her around because I believe that those two things make me happier here mm -hmm. than for me right. to dive all the way through. Right. Right. So these compromises that I'm making in life aren't really something that that I look back and say, like, I had to take something away in order for me to get something that was second secondary to the first place part that mm -hmm. I wanted. Mm -hmm. It's actually something better because I get to have I honestly it's like me having my cake and being able to eat it too. Yeah. It sucks though sometimes because I know what you feel like. Because mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes too, where I'm like, I feel sometimes where I'm in a place where I say, mm, I wonder if I could be the next biggest Asian actor out there, mm -hmm, right? If mm -hmm. I dropped everything, signed it to an acting agency, do all this stuff, become delved in with these acting classes, drop, maybe even drop YouTube and just become like a thespian, just become yeah. a fucking actor, yeah, right? Yeah, just go 100%. I'll go 100%, smash all these fucking actors out the way, right? I'll show you how great an Asian actor can be when they actually, when they have fucking skill and talent. Yeah. These are thoughts that do run in my fucking head. Yeah. And But then when I think about the process and what I have to leave for that, it's, right. never, it's never worth it for me. Right, right. Well, it's just not realistic, right? I mean, because like you said, you can make that a reality, but in terms of what you want and in, in your current place in life and, and, and into the future, that doesn't fit into that. You yeah. know what I mean? And then so like, again, that's that's exactly that what I'm talking about, that that fork in the road where, yeah. where it's like, yeah, you are happier making the decision you made to, to you know, have the relationship and, and build on that and having a little bit of these things. But then my thing has always been I don't want to leave any stone unturned and question what if, yeah, what if that's my biggest fear is asking myself if, if God willing, I could live to 60, 70, 80, whatever. I look back on my life and I'm like, fuck, what if at that moment, because only because it, it was something that actually meant something to me like yeah. and it gave me purpose not just because i'm i'm, I'm uh, asking and posing random questions of what if i did this and what if i no because it meant something to me and it and it gave me fulfillment and purpose yet i chose to either on my own will or because i was forced to well i think for you too that like you should yeah. think about definites then yeah, like yeah, you need yeah. To think what those definite goals are. It yeah. can't be broad or general. No, I know, right? I know, I so, know. So for me, I don't have a what if in acting because mm -hmm. I proved that I could do what I could do. Mm -hmm. Went to Sundance, mm -hmm. sold a film, mm -hmm. did it on my first go. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't need to prove anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want to do another film, I have to, you know, put the work in and the elbow grease and maybe I'll be able to do it again. Yeah. But that scratch has been itched. So I don't really need to look back at it. Mm. I really don't. I don't yeah. care to, yeah. you know, probably the only itch that I kind of want to scratch that it doesn't feel that great is me and music. Like mm -hmm. I've never done it a hundred percent. I've only done it like maybe 10%. Yeah. As a, as a side hobby. Yeah. So a part of me is kind of like, yeah, hey, I want to do a full album at least once. Yeah. And then I want to do, um, and then just leave it at that. So that's probably one thing, but I, because I haven't solidified a def definitive goal for it, it's not something that I probably will tackle until I figure that out. Well, that, I yeah. mean, that that is 
that in and of itself is a definitive goal though one album right so if, yeah, yeah. I mean, but in terms of not just one album it's yeah. like i could say one album right? yeah but it's like you know i have to take the time to figure out the sound the mm -hmm. vibe mm -hmm. start getting into music it's going to be a whole process mm -hmm. so unless i'm really committed to that i i have to look back at it as like am i really going to regret this mm -hmm. you know that's the other thing too it's like is this is this something that i'm a great or is it just a want mm. those that's the hard part too sometimes because sometimes yeah. I, I i confuse my wants for actual goals mm. You know, it's like, do I want this or do I need this? Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah. You know, yeah. what I needed was to see if I can become a legitimate actor. Mm -hmm. And because I found out that I can, mm -hmm. I just don't have the the mental capacity for it. I'm not built for it. I hate, I, I don't like the, the industry part of it is what I didn't expect. But mm -hmm. what I did find out is that I do have somewhat of, of an ability that if I wanted to try, that I could be somewhat successful. Mm. So that thing is scratched. Mm. With with uh, music, I don't know if I if I have a scratch that needs to be itched. That's that's the difference, right? Itch that needs to be scratched. An itch that needs to be scratched. <laughs> no, it's the other way around. A scratch yeah. that needs to be itched. <laughs> no, but here's the thing for me is that creativity is an absolute requirement and need, like a necessity in my life. Without it, but you could do that with anything. Though. No, I know, but th that's why I need these outlets, right? But it's it's kind of tricky when music has been that outlet for so long and then now you have to figure out other outlets to, to do that in. And so, you know, I told you before, things like taking pictures and just editing them, mm -hmm. I don't do that for like necessarily the gram. I do that because I get joy out of it. Yeah. I get fulfillment. It, it allows my brain to, to kind of go in a place that I needed to for me to feel sane. You know, I need that outlet. But then once I have those things become less and less a part of my life because I got other responsibilities taking up my time and energy, that's when I start to have these Well, that's what I'm saying. Thoughts. This is where yeah. you need to figure out what the compromise is then. Mm -hmm. So what is your compromise where you can make both of those things happen together? That's, where you have a been, mix of the artistry yeah. and, and a, to the point where it could sustain a certain lifestyle. That, those yeah. answers are there. It's just, it's very difficult because with art, when you compromise art, it yeah. feels like you're losing everything. For sure, for sure. And that, that's that been the thing, difficult thing to figure out yeah, and answer. That's the hard part. Yeah. But that's the space where I'm in, where I was talking about because I feel like I'm compromising my art and it's not going to be perfect, mm -hmm. I just stop doing stuff in general. And yeah. I start dwelling in my thoughts. Right. Well, that's also problematic. For you know? sure. It and doles you out. It yeah, doles, it you, doles out, you out. Man. And you're not really sharpening a tool. Yeah. You know? And so for me, I figured out that I'm just going to stay active and create stuff. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. And mm -hmm. as I'm doing that, I'm going to create something else. Mm -hmm. But I also know that there's certain needs to be met. Like, for example, and the same thing goes with anything that we do in any in food industry, clothing industry, anything else. Yeah. There's always going to be a fine line that you have to figure out what what is it that I can create that's going to be um, beneficial and also like support me. Yeah. But at the same time, still taps into this artistry side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's and like I said, I'll say it again. When you compromise on your art, it feels like you're losing everything. That's the one thing that I do that I feel like that I feel as if um, when I make this compromise, I'm not coming out on top. I'm yeah, actually losing more than sure, anything else. For sure. And then that's the struggle, man. And that's like that's the ongoing like question that you're trying to find an answer yeah. to. And then you got to figure out this bigger arch right so yeah. i know people who you know they feel like they're artists and they have art you know that they they have their artist needs yeah but they had their overarching thing is that i want to be financially stable and yeah. i want my family to be okay right so because that is number one in their life satisfying that is more important than satisfying for their sure tertiary. for sure so you know it is what it is they 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 get their fulfillment by creating their 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 watered down art here and there, mm. but because this need is met first, yeah, it may it it actually makes them feel better because if it was the other way around where their art was completely met but their family was not stable and suffering, mm -hmm. it would kill them inside for sure. But when they do it this way, for sure, they kind of feel like they're living a little bit without, but they're very happy. Yeah, so that's also prioritizing those needs are also yeah. very important, and that's the hard part because like for me. Both are just hypothetical situations. It's yeah. both possibilities, but it's like in the road to, or the path to um, getting married and starting a family is still a path that exists for me, yeah. but how much am I going to prioritize that over the things that I want well, to do? Well, maybe you need to just go all in and scratch the itch. <laughs>
<laughs> not itch the scratch. No, nope. you got to scratch that itch first, uh-huh. and then maybe you can move on to the next. Uh-huh. So right now, maybe right now you're trying to grasp at too many fucking straws. Yeah. So you're grasping at too many things. So maybe figure out what you want to do first, and if if whatever that is, I don't know, make enough money where I can support all my basic needs. If that's the thing, then you need to go for that. If it's I need this just be an artist then maybe you just need to do that yeah because that's what i did yeah it helped me anyways right when i said hey i'm gonna do this film i dropped everything i dropped everything mariel barely saw me too Mm -hmm. and i just delved into this fucking character i gained a shit ton of weight shaved my fucking head looked like a fucking loser (laughs) just so i could play this loser on screen yeah and it worked out yeah and then it felt very satisfying and i didn't need to look back at it there is no regret or what if yeah for sure for sure. I even told people, if you two disappear tomorrow, I, mm. I think I'd be pretty happy. Mm. I, I'll, fi- I'll find another job and say, hey, I got to do all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, I'm sure you would reflect on it in fondly. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, now we're talking about a situation you're forced into rather than you chose to do, right? And then that's when, that's when these questions become, I feel like, more um, stressful, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, because yeah, I have no doubt that you'd be able to figure something out to do, but are you going to enjoy it? Or is it going to be something that gives you extra perspective on how much you enjoyed doing this, even times when you felt like it's it's getting stale for you, then you do doing this other shit, you know? Because these new experiences, like we were talking about traveling, always gives you that perspective, right? It's like, ah, shit, that wasn't so bad. Not as bad as I thought it was because now I'm doing something that I know <laughs> you know yeah i mean but i i could find fulfillment in just about anything because Mm -hmm. i don't have definitives in my life Mm -hmm. when it comes to finding joy Mm -hmm. i know that that definition of what makes me happy is always going to be changing my youtube channel by Mm -hmm. the way Mm -hmm. is the greatest example of that yeah my youtube channel makes no sense at all Mm -hmm. i do cooking shit out of nowhere (laughs) i I do this carpal confession shit i started doing podcast stuff and people go yo why don't you just continue to, to do the stuff that's very successful yeah because it doesn't make me happy. Exactly. Like, I exactly. just, I just, I created my channel not for the sole purpose of recognition. I created my channel because it was fun. Yeah. And if I don't have the fun part of it, then there's absolutely no point. I'll and, just go work a nine to five. And that's why you reached that point of unhappiness because you were treating it like a grind. Yeah. You're like I'm gonna just keep making content. You know. At the same time, yeah, you were trying to maintain like your. I guess, artistry and your will within what you were doing. But then it's like, you know, that becomes kind of a give and take situation, Mm -hmm. right? When your sole priority is stack chips, make content consistently, pump it out like a factory. You're going to get fucking burned out. There's no way. But once again, because I did that, now I'm allowed to live a little more freely. Right. So those sacrifices weren't for not. Right. And I think that's where probably you're in a situation like that right now too. That there's there's routes, you know, it's just you're gonna have to make that choice to figure out what you're gonna have to live without for a bit to for oh, yeah, the, I know. the bigger goal that you want. That, those are the things that I'm having uh difficulty deciding on. Yeah. You know, I I'm aware of like the things I need to decide on, yeah. right? But it's just like more there's more risk now to make those decisions. It's yeah. that, and that's what I'm alluding to. At 25, if I had those, uh, you know, questions, I make a choice and I just roll with it. Whatever, I'll roll with the punches. <laughs> this time around, I can't be as, I guess, uh, free about it. You yeah. know, it takes more deliberation. It takes more consideration. There's other things and other people that I have to consider and think about. Yeah, and then that that's why it puts me in this spot where I'm like in my head and in my thoughts with all this time you know what i mean yeah Yeah. but i'm sure you know as time goes on it i'll figure it out eventually you know it's a process but for now it's just been driving me a little bit nuts you know yeah Yeah. that's why you need to sleep because you'll be up all night thinking about yeah exactly man that's i i i Maybe I need to try some of that uh, THC with uh, the CBD, man. (laughs) Shit. Well, guys, that wraps up this episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. A lot of deep shit, a lot of funny shit, actually, especially with the uh, with the advice talk. Uh, Mm. Yeah. Hey, man, you'll get over it. Yeah. Fuck up, pal. You'll be fine, man. <laughs> you, you, you literally hit rock bottom. There's only up now at this point. Mm-hmm. But you can find Edric at Ed2 on Instagram and also at Secret Society and everything else like that. Every podcast is going to be on Thursday and Sundays, and we will catch you all next time. All right, y'all. Peace. Peace.